How can you be honest about the messiness of your past without losing joy in your present? How can you face the challenges of your future without giving in to fear in the moment? The answer is simple. Remember to include and. Welcome to week number six of our journey through the book of Titus, entitled And. How long do you think it takes? How long does it take for someone to get a first impression of you? How long does it take for, for someone to, to look at you and decide if they want to get to know you better, have a longer conversation? invest their time or energy in a potential relationship. Experts would tell you, uh, I found this in a, a Forbes article, that, that most entrepreneurs, most business people, people who live in the, the business world would actually tell you that in less than seven seconds, someone will have enough information about what they think you're like, what your trustworthiness level is, who you are in order to decide if they want to go any further, invest their time or energy in, in giving you that position, or maybe even want to get to know you better. When you hear those stats, that it takes less than seven seconds in many people's minds, and, and almost every expert would say less than 30 seconds, how does that make you feel? That based on 30 seconds of time, people are going to identify you in a certain way, view you through a certain lens, think about you as a certain kind of person. Like, like when you hear that, how does it make you feel? If the first thing it, that's on your mind is, that's not fair, that's not right, I'm being judged without any knowledge, okay, that might be true, but you know what? doesn't change the reality. You might not like it, you might not want to hear it, you might not care, but it's real. And then there's this. If first impressions are that powerful, what about the compound interest of impressions? Not just the first impression that you give, but but what about those relationships you have, the interactions in your life, the, the people that, that surround you? How about the compound interest of the impressions? That if you're working in the same cubicle, if you walk your dog on the same sidewalk, if you live under the same roof, if you're connected in the same family, if you attend the same school, if you go to the same gym, if you stop each and every day at, at, your, at the same coffee shop, what about the compound interest of impressions. Like what message do you send over and over and over again and what's the impact of that message? It matters. We all know it and whether we like it or not, it reveals a lot. And here's how I know that. Many of you know that, that I have this crazy habit of getting up at 4.20 each and every morning of the week, getting to the gym by 4.45 a.m. and working out. And there's a lot of you going, that's just crazy. Okay, that's part of my identity then, I'll take it. But you know what? There are a lot of other crazy people like me. In fact, if you go to any gym and you work out regularly at the same place, you're likely to probably go at the same time. And there is a group and nucleus of people who who I've crossed paths with, interacted with, been with the gym at the same time because that's what people who want to work out early to avoid a large crowd of people do. And they've been the same people at Planet Fitness over the last six plus years. And my wife and I show up and they're there. They're in the same areas. They're walking on the same treadmills. And I guess if I took out their earbuds and, and listened to what television show they were watching, it would be the same one. And I know you're... Impressions matter because of one of those people. A lady who worked out at the gym at the same time, who, 
who talked to everyone she could come into contact with, as one of those people at the gym who, who Pastor Tim looked at and said, you know, you're here for a reason. Like, we're working out. This is not social hour at the coffee shop. But that was her. And she talked to my wife, and, and, and they interacted, and, and they got to know each other, but not me. Like, I, I'm at my bench. I'm lifting my weights. I'm moving from place to place. I might give you a nod occasionally, but, but this is my space and my time. Until one day I saw her talking to my wife, and then I got in the car and I said, what were you guys talking about? And she said, I don't think you're much going to like it. I'm like, why is that? And she said, because it was about you. And I said, about me? Like, did I not wipe down the, the bench after I was done and get my sweat off of it? And she's like, no. And she came up to me and said, so your husband's a pastor, right? I was like, yeah, he is. And she said, huh. He's not very friendly like I would expect pastors to be. <laughs> He's kind of rude. And just imagine for a moment I paused and what blurted out of my mouth. That's not right. That's not me. That's not fair. Like I'm at the gym to, to, to do a job to get my lifting in because I, I care about physical fitness. And, and my wife goes, no, that's you. Like I've told you this, when you come into my office to get your teeth clean, that there are, are people there who, who don't go to church all the time, and, and you're kind of rude. Like you're there to get a job done, to get your teeth cleaned, and, and you kind of walk in, you don't talk, you don't smile, you don't say hi, you don't ask how your day is going, you just go. She's kind of right. And I mumbled a little bit, and I said she's not, and, and then I had to realize... She was. And while not intentional, it gave an impression. A far more important impression than about the ones I give off to the world, about what kind of husband I am, or what kind of dad I am, or, or what I do as a living, and how hard I work at it. No, it had spiritual implications. And that's what the Apostle Paul in, in the book of Titus today is going to remind us of. In fact, he's going to tell Titus, I, I want you to remind God's people of this. It, it's this very important truth that I, that I want you to take away, and, and then I want you to see God's and for today and how uh, we attack it and how we apply it to our life of faith. And, and here's the statement, how you live, how you live, the words that you speak in your cubicle, the, the way in which you carry yourself as you walk the dog down the sidewalk, the, the, the things that you do as you're walking through the, the aisles of the grocery store, the the tapping of the feet, the frustration, the, the tone of your voice when you get to the register and, and, and impatiently uh, want to get out of there as fast as possible. How you live, how you walk, how you talk, the nonverbals that you carry yourself with says a lot about your identity. Not just the, the, the individual Tim Glendy, who's husband, father, worker, pastor, friend, neighbor. It says a lot about your spiritual identity which has far deeper consequences when it comes to impressions because they have lasting implications. And the Apostle Paul knew that. He knew that was true for Christians 2,000 years ago, and he knows it's still true for us today. So I pray that, that God speaks to your heart today to consider how you live because of the message that, that God longs for you to send about who you are, a holy, loved, redeemed, name written in the book of life, child of God. And there's two important things to remember about that lifestyle that the Apostle Paul is going to give us today that he wants us to display. Uh, we're starting in Titus chapter 3, verse 1 today, and these first three verses give us our first truth. The Apostle Paul says this, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. The Apostle Paul in this section, before we go on to the, that last verse there, is really speaking now to the, the Christians in Crete and about their life in the world. Chapters 1 and 2 dealt a lot with how Christians interact with one another, how the Christian church is to, to carry out its ministry, what, what you're to look for in a, in a pastor and leaders. So all sorts of things uh, that were aimed at the church inside the boundaries of the building, inside the boundaries of uh, the church family and their relationships and interactions. And now he's going to go outside of that circle. 
because God's people live in a real world. Like we spend an hour here, an hour and 10 minutes here because pastor preaches too long. But out there, you're, you're, you're there for 160 plus hours of the week, right? It matters. And that's why Paul said to Titus, remind the people of these things. And so the focus is going to change on that interaction. And I would sum up Paul's words right here with, with one important truth about how you live and why it matters. Uh, that how you live reveals a lot about who you are. And it's found in your attitude. It, it, that's what the Apostle Paul is really talking about here. What kind of heart do you have? What kind of attitude on the inside of your heart overflows outside in your life? Because out of the heart overflows all of your behavior and your emotions. The heart controls all the things that happen on the outside. So, so what's your attitude when it comes to how you view and live out with others in your world? Did you catch it? Let's go back to the verse, if you can put it on the screen. Now, the Apostle Paul talks about the attitude in your relationship with the government. He says, be subject to the rulers and authorities. Put yourself under. Obey them. See, the Apostle Paul recognized in his world it was no different than the world 2,000 years ago, and it's no different than the world would be 2,000 years in the future where we live today. That one of the greatest tension points in our world is with authority, with rulers, with the government. And, and you want to know what a lot of people in the world who, who don't know God, who don't know Jesus, view how Christians talk about and feel about the government? You don't practice what you preach. Be subject to, put yourself under willingly. Obey the laws. I know God says in his word, you must obey God rather than men. But so many people disobey and break laws knowingly and willingly because they think they're above the law. Like you think you're better than the speed limit. You, you think you're better than what the government's laid out from a tax perspective and so you willingly and deceptively don't pay. I'm not talking about finding every opportunity you can to save money and, 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 and maximize your, your tax return. I'm talking about the, the things you do that are wrong. Then add to it, how about the, the obedience? And how do you speak to and show respect to those in authority? I don't care what side of the political line you're on, because you know what? Next election or two down the road, you're going to be on the other side of those who are in power. And, and all that's going to happen is there's going to be different people complaining, grumbling, questioning, shaking fist at, undermining, name-calling those in authority. Like if I looked at your social media feed, if I listened to your conversations with your family over the holidays, when politics come up, so does the intensity, the emotions. And you know what that reveals to the world? Not a godly attitude. So Paul says, remind the people that authorities are in a position worthy of respect. Or how about the attitude when you view others in your community, in your neighborhood, at your work? He says, be ready to do whatever is good. Be a you-first Christian. He says, don't slander anyone. Guard people's reputation. Like their reputation is everything. Their identity matters. When people hear their name, don't be the one who, who's caused it to be covered in mud. Be peaceable and considerate. But don't be the person who likes to spark every fire and every conversation with some form of conflict. Like don't throw gasoline on fires. Instead, try and put them out. Be kind. Be gentle. Like there are people who are going to be weak. There are going to be people who don't get it morally. There are going to be people you come into contact with who, who find out about Jesus and you think that all of a sudden all the mess, all, all the, the garbage, all the, the language should change in a heartbeat and go away. It doesn't. Like you, you know what the difference is? You're just a little bit less messy because you've known Jesus a little longer maybe. But you're still a mess. You're still sinful. And so God says, be gentle and not in your face. And that all flows from an attitude. Are you a you first Christian 
Are, are you a Christian who wants to let others be first and you be second, who wants to set aside your rights because you long for others to know Jesus? Or are you going to be a better than Christian? I'm better than you. I know more than you. You're not as good as me. Your attitude matters. And that's why the Apostle Paul gives the next section. Because we need to have an attitude adjustment to understand our identity. It's why he says this. At one time, we too were foolish. Notice how he throws himself in the same boat. Paul remembered the road to Damascus. He remembered that once he was a persecutor of God, he hated God, he was all about himself and, and, and puffing himself up and, and getting credentials and notches in his belt when it came to taking Christians down. He says, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. In other words, he said, I'm no different than you. And he would say, St. Peter and the core 922 Christians, you're no different than him or anyone else. Because there was a point in your life when you were outside of God. There was a moment in your life when, when God invaded your heart. And whether it was like Jack today and, and he'll never know any different, God willing, that his parents will bring him up to know Jesus and he'll never leave the faith. Or if it was when you were 35 and you came to know God. But, but all of us, by nature, by birth, are born outside of God, period. So we need to remember this about our identity. In order to be the people God longs for us to be, it's the next fill in the blank as you're following along, maybe on your phones or in your notes. The Apostle Paul would said, how we live says a lot about our identity. So he says, be humble. Be humble because of who you were. And that's so hard at times, isn't it? It's so easy to feel like I'm a better than Christian because I've been a Christian for all my life. It's so easy to believe that I'm a better than person because... Because I get it, I have morals, I know uh, the government and what they should do and, and can complain about what they don't do. Like I'm better than, because I, I don't curse and swear openly in public at work. I mean, I'd probably lose my job if I did, but you get the point. And that's Paul's point. That's not you by nature, that's not what you deserve, you're, you're not better than. You've been saved by grace. Be humble of who you were. Be humble because of who you were. And the fact that without someone who was humble like Jesus, who humbled himself and became obedient to a cross, you'd be lost. Your name wouldn't be written in the book of life. And that's the first part of the and. Be humble because of who you were, knowing that you were saved from something. From your sin. From your deserved punishment from an eternity outside of God. Be humbled. Carry yourself differently. Let your attitude be that as of Christ Jesus, who, who always honored those in authority, who, who never slandered anyone's reputation, who was always peaceable and, and, and looking to, to lower the, the level of the fire of the conflict. Who went to the cross, humbly, carrying out the will of God so that you and I might be saved from sin, death, and the devil. And when you know that, isn't there something that changes your perspective about who you are? How you want to come across the impression you want to give? And that's what the Apostle Paul launched into next. It's his and. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, you once were lost, you... You, you once were separated from God, and you've been found. You, you've been saved from something. When the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, and we poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. See, the Apostle Paul knew something was different about his identity. That in that moment when, when God stopped him on the road, God brought him to faith, he recognized Jesus as Lord and Savior and his identity, his life mission, who he was and how he lived was forever changed. He was humbled because of who he was in the past. But this sentence reveals so much about the Apostle Paul in his heart and what he knew was also true in his life. 
That when you read that sentence in Greek, I want you to see, uh, know something about it. It's like four verses in, in, in our, our English Bibles. Uh, it's, it's broken up into two sentences when you, when you look at it on the screen. But literally in Greek, there is no period ever in this sentence. If you gave this to any English professor and you turned in a sentence like this on a paper, you know what they would do? They'd circle it in red and they'd put question marks all over it because it's a run-on sentence. The phrases are all over the place. It makes no sense. Like, like you're jumping all over the map. Like, like give me some perspective. Put an exclamation point and, and give me a colon or, or, or give me a comma or, or, or change it up a little bit, right? And the Apostle Paul can't help himself. He's so overwhelmed. Because he was humbled by who he was or because he knew that wasn't the case anymore. And when you talk like this, when you write like this, I just read one of my son's things that he's working on at school. He sometimes asks me to proofread things. I send him back, hey, put a period here, uh, put these sentences together. You, you know, you want to make coherent sense. The Apostle Paul here, he just wants one thing to resonate with you. It's why he goes on and on and on and on and on. Because he had the joy of Jesus. He knew Jesus had changed his identity. He knew that God loved him in spite of him. He knew that God brought him to faith through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that gave him great joy. Hey, if you're filling in the blanks, here's the, the second part to how you live. It says a lot about who you are, your identity. That's why we need to be humble, remembering who we were. But it's also why each and every day, every street that we walk down, every aisle that we we go down in the grocery store, every hour spent in the gym, all the time spent in our home, every conversation in the cubicle at work. God would have us remember this, be joyful because of who you are. A lot of people see Christians and, and they say, you, you don't look any different. Like when circumstances hit, when, when it gets really difficult, you cower and crumble like everybody else. They look at you at work when when you're at the machine right next to them, when you're at the computer desk in the same cubicle, and, and they, they hear you and they see you, and they, they wonder, well, they lack peace, just like me. What, what's different? And, and Paul would say, remember the gospel. When the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God himself came down and took on human flesh, be overwhelmed. Just like we sing at Christmas time when we celebrate his arrival with joy to the world. Be overwhelmed that, that he saved you, not because of righteous things you have done. You're no better than anybody else. You haven't measured up to the, the level God expects, but he saved you because of the righteous one, his mercy. Celebrate that he saved you through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's why I pray Jack's family never, ever, 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 ever lets him forget today. Because today, God wrote his name in the book of life. I mean, it got updated in Planning Center a long time ago when he was born, but the book of life. <laughs> the angels in heaven had a party today. And on the day you were baptized and came to faith. Be joyful. Because eternity is yours. You have a destination. That no matter how bad this life is, no matter how many broken relationships you have, you're going to a place where there is no brokenness, there is no cancer, there is no disease, there, there's none of that. It's only joy. And you know what, my friends? People should see that in us when we go out in the world. But like, they shouldn't see the, the, the unhappy, the, the not-so-nice, the, the, the not-so-friendly person at the gym. Yeah, I can do my thing, and I can work out really hard, but I can also have a smile on my face and stop and pause and and acknowledge people, build relationships with people, create open doors maybe for an invitation to the person who matters most. Be joyful in my home when my kids see me so that they see Jesus. Be joyful in my cubicle, be joyful when I get the diagnosis of disease, when, when circumstances get hard, when, when life is difficult. You know what Jesus even said about this world? In this life, you'll have troubles. But you can still be joyful because he's overcome the world. This last Thursday, my son sent me a, a text message that had a, a Twitter post on it. How many of you have ever heard of Nick Foles? Quarterback for the Jacksonville Jaguars. MVP of the Super Bowl, even though he was a backup. 
This year, he got a big contract. He got to a new team. He was going to be the man. Like, he was going to take them to the next level. You know what happened on the first drive of the season this year? I think it was broken collarbone. Out nine games. And this last week, he got the clear to come back. He's, he's playing this week, and, and he was at the podium this week doing some interviews before the game, and one of the people asked him, how did the last nine weeks go? Or, was there ever a time where you were scared or worried or, or upset about your injury and losing the opportunity? Did you ever wonder that, that this Minshew kid, this rookie who came in, who, who, who became all the thing, was going to take your job and you weren't going to get it back? Because most people in the world would say, that's horrible, right? Like, here was your chance and it all fell apart. And you know what he said? Yeah, it wasn't fun. I definitely wouldn't wish it upon anybody. But you know, in the middle of that, God used it for my good. You know what? Super Bowl MVPs don't define me, he said. He said it was great, but when I held up that trophy, when you saw me smile, it, wasn't not, it was not because I got the trophy, but because God is so good. I have God. And this is like the gravy, or as Pastor Mike might say, this is like the most amazing sushi. Because I got Jesus, and I'm good. So it doesn't really matter how well I do. I'm glad I'm coming back, but, but if I get hurt again, it's okay, because I got Jesus. Like, that guy was on a podium proclaiming this proudly in a world where no one would. Because he had joy. This is what God wants us to have. No matter what the circumstances, no matter what the location, because it matters in the world in which we live. And that's why Paul came back to this at the end of the section. You've been saved from something, and you've been saved for something. This is a trustworthy saying. I want you to stress these things so that those who've trusted in God, that's you and me, believers, those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. Stress this. Emphasize this. Be this. Live this. How you live says a lot about your identity because these things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Not just you. Not just your church family. Not just the people under your roof. But for those who are, you meet on the sidewalk as they're walking their dog, for those who you encounter at the gym, for those who you work with in your cubicle. But here's the takeaway that, that I want you to see and remember. Christians, we need to live knowing we were saved from and for. From and for. We were saved from something, from sin. And we were saved for something. To be light in the world. To, to give the impression to others about who we are, holy, redeemed, children of God, names written in the book of life, destined for heaven, people who have joy and, and a peace that the world can't give, who have self-control in the face of temptation, who are gentle with their words, who are considerate with their actions. Because we've been saved from something, for something. And, and how do you do that, right? How do you live a joyful life? I'm going to give you something practical that, that maybe might help because you wonder how, how pastor every day when I go out into the world, when I go to my workplace, when I'm walking the streets, when I'm at a restaurant, how, how do I find joy in each and every moment because life is hard? Well, I would tell you, be thankful. You know what thankfulness is? It's the most powerful human emotion. It boosts serotonin levels. Any expert doctor would tell you the more thankful you are, the more up you'll feel, the, the, the different nonverbals that you'll give. Be thankful. And here's how a Christian can, can live in a way that is thankful at all times. Here's the three things I would tell you to remember to be thankful for. And it takes about a minute. Maybe begin your day this way, stop during the middle of your day this way, end this, your day this way. Be thankful first of all uh, for this, this thing. Three things, if you're writing them down. Be thankful for what God did in your baptism. Martin Luther said, remember your baptism every day. Be thankful for your baptism. And as you're thankful for that, don't just remember, I got washed with water, pastor spoke some words, I wore a cute white dress. No, be thankful that there were people, people in your life, a parent who, who literally walked you up to that font, that they knew what God was going to give you. Like, thank God for your parents who gave you a legacy of faith. Be thankful that on that day God wrote your name in the book of life. Be thankful for your baptism and all that it means for your identity. Now, once you say that, be thankful not just for what God did in your baptism, what God is doing for you right now today. Not just your home, not just the food on the plate, not just the friends that you have, but for the forgiveness that is yours right now, the peace that is yours right now. Because you know what you did yesterday? Same thing I did. You royally messed up when it came to God's commands. We didn't do it perfectly, but today you know what you can wake up in light of? Grace. 
Be thankful for today, another day and opportunity to live for God, to, to be light in the world. Be thankful for what he did in your baptism. Be thankful in your prayers for what he's doing for you right now, and be thankful for what's in store for you, a place where there is perfect peace, no brokenness, no sin. Heaven is yours. Like, if you can tell yourself each and every day, you can begin it with a prayer of thankfulness. It takes less than a minute to say, thank you, God, for what you did in my baptism. <laughs> thank you, God, for what you're doing for me today. Thank you, God, for what you will do for me one day. That cannot help but take you to a different place and fill you with joy. Which is why I love that my wife is the perfect counterpoint to me. Because she had that conversation with that, that woman at the gym, and she defended me. <laughs> like, no, that's not really how he is. You need to get to know him better. You should come to church sometime. And she did. In spite of me. <laughs> and because of her. And it's been about a year and she's come to church on quite a few occasions. And I thank God for that. I thank God for that. And not just that she came, but that she was a light bulb in, in my life. That said, we need to remember that how we live says a lot about who we are. Which is what one of the members on Thursday night said to her, because she was in church on Thursday night when I preached about this. And he went up to her and said, thank you for putting him in his place and keeping him humble. To which I said, that was in the sermon. Amen. Right? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, keep us humble because of who we were. And make us joyful because of who we are. How we live says a lot about who we are, our identity. And we want to leave this place, Lord, filled with joy. Because of what you did for us in our baptism, what you're doing for us today, because of where we're headed. Because we want other people to see you, the light of the world through us and that's the end and why we can do it because we've been saved from something and for something that very purpose lord give us strength to carry this out and allow us to be your light in our lives